thanks. First of all, thank you so much to all the volunteers and the organizers of SCALE. Uh, you know, this is a volunteer conference, so I just want to give uh, all those committees a plug. If you had a great time, uh, if you're interested in contributing and pitching in, uh, I'm pretty sure every committee possible could use a hand. So whether that's the tech team, the .org committee, um, pretty much if you are interested in pitching back in, uh, reach out to any of the uh, committee chairs. They'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, and then also thanks to the sponsors, so that way we can actually do this. Uh, I can, we can be wired with coffee, which is great. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, running a home lab and what that looks like. Um, in particular, we're, uh, we're going to talk about sort of the journey that I went on and kind of how I like proceeded further and further away from hardware and how I got way further up in the clouds, um, you know, being disconnected from what it actually means to like run systems and thinking about the actual hardware that's actually running the workloads you're using. So, you know, it's great. Obviously, we have all these different abstractions, and so we don't need to be thinking about NICs and hardware and all the different problems that we have with that. You know, we can think about services. We can think about the different regions that we're running uh, our workloads in and how we make sure that we're distributing that so that way our customers are able to connect that very quickly. So when we're building these distributed systems, we're able to leverage a lot of the tools and techniques that we've built out over the years. But what I found, at least, is that I was sort of losing that passion. And you know, there's something different you get when you're actually having to like fiddle around with some of the hardware, or you're really thinking about, how am I going to architect this at a very low level? And if you're thinking in terms of thousands of servers or tens of thousands of servers, you kind of lose that, like, you know, the feeling of like the pet, like, oh, here's my little, like, you know, my home server. This is the like hard drive that has all my like, you know, home videos or whatever that I'm saving. Um, and so I think there's a lot of benefits here that we'll get into. Uh, the way we're going to sort of build this up is through different layers. So the first one, we're going to really think about how are we approaching the infrastructure, like how are we thinking about the hardware, and sort of what's that base layer. You know, this is primarily the stuff that AWS, GCP is going to abstract for you that you're not really going to be able to leverage anymore once you're running in the cloud. So I'm advocating that if you don't have a home lab, I think it's worth your time. <coughs> Pardon. And I think it's going to be, uh, you know, you're going to learn a lot, and you're actually hopefully going to be more connected to what you're running. Uh, once that's in place, uh, the talk is actually going to pick up speed a lot. Um, I think this is where we're able to use a lot of the cool cloud native technologies uh, that the community has built out, and so we're going to be able to take advantage of that. And then, you know, kind of what's the point of this? Like, what do you want to build on top? Uh, you know, what are some of the different cool uh, self-hosted projects that you can use once you have this infrastructure that's, uh, you know, in your apartment or in your house? Um, I'm sure a lot of folks are going to ask. This was the first question I asked when I saw slides like this. Uh, there's an open source project written in Python called Look at Me, which you use to generate the slides. So if you're at all interested in that, I would recommend you look at this. And then I used uh, GraphViz to ASCII generator for some of the diagrams that we'll be going into. Um, so I graduated uh, from Chapman University down in Orange County uh, in 2010 uh, with Big Rob, who runs the network and the Wi-Fi here. Um, we, uh, we had a pretty good time, and you know, we were building a bunch of the systems that uh, you know, are still in use today, which is pretty exciting. He was telling me, I think, uh, the Spacewalk server we built 15 years ago is still down there. Um, and so, you know, going from really like tinkering on all of the hardware, really like using Minicom and like serial ports to like flash APs, think about, you know, hey, the DHCP server in like Smith Hall is down, I've got to go like truck out and like drop a replacement in there. Um, you know, really getting that like hands on experience, I think really was beneficial, especially as a student. And then sort of over time, you know, going from Google um, and sort of like moving up the stack into the cloud, you know, again, we're thinking in terms of large scale, but, you know, we're moving away from that, uh, that opportunity. And so, um, you know, to uh, great pride, I think I still have, um, you know, at school I was definitely that kid who was like so obsessed with Linux, well, GNU Linux and open source. Uh, you know, whenever the yearly uh, IT team would come by and like reprovision each of the computer labs, uh, I would like follow behind them lab by lab with like 20 live CDs, and I would drop in like an 8.04 like Hardy Heron disk, and I would like dual boot everything, uh, which was great because a lot of people were using Linux for the first time, even if it was kind of inadvertently. Uh, which was sort of good. So, um, so I think you know, trying to find that joy again is really the, the point of this. So from a high level, what we're thinking about building, um, you know, for me, one of the goals that I wanted to do, like the application that was my killer app that sort of justified all of this, uh, was something called uh, Task Server. And it's the synchronization system, uh, there we go, synchronization system for like a to-do app that's uh, primarily run in the terminal. And it's very powerful, very feature rich. There's a ton of complexity in there. And like, there's several talks on YouTube, which I encourage you to check out if you're interested. Um, but basically, you can create different projects and, and have all this running here. And it's great by itself if you just want to run on one machine, like one laptop like this. But if you have several laptops or a server, if you want to run it on your mobile device, you need some way to synchronize that data. And that's where the task server comes into play. So there's a way you can configure each of your clients and make sure that they can communicate with the server, uh, upload that data, and then bring 
it down so you're always able to know, you know, what is the thing that I'm running a little behind on and I need to, to keep tabs on. Uh, so in order to run this application, uh, the thing that I decided to use for this was uh, Kubernetes distribution. I finally decided to kick the tires on that. Um, I decided to use a distribution called K3s, which is from the rancher folks uh, who were inquired by SUSE. Uh, super, super impressed with this, very easy. Uh, for me, this wasn't necessarily like my opportunity to learn how to like do Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, I just wanted to get this up and running and I was really focused on like more of the lower level. Again, I wanted to think about, you know, I just want to run kube and you know, for me the exciting part was like thinking about the lower levels, how am I going to pixie boot servers, stuff like that. Uh, which is a great transition because the technology we're going to use for that is called MAS, or Metal as a Service. And that's by Canonical and the Ubuntu community. And we're going to spend a lot of time digging in there, and that's really going to be the meat of this talk. Uh, we're also going to talk about what types of physical machines you want to use. What are some of the servers? How much you think about tying up the network? And how do you want to architect things in order to make sure that they're um, going to be able to communicate with each other and you can actually connect all these services appropriately? And to start, uh, we're going to kind of go into the, the home lab. And so like I was saying, the um, you know, when I first started, I was really going in, you know, I was really excited about technology, right? There was just so much potential with the open source community, so many people that had their own itch to scratch, they were coming together, collaborating, and building something pretty awesome. And so I think over the years, you know, I really was focusing on, um, you know, solving business use cases. You know, how do we think about the customers? How do we make sure that we're really uh, accelerating our delivery? How do we make sure we're doing things in a reliable and repeatable way? And I think, you know, focusing on that obviously is super critical, but I think I lost that opportunity to really like jump in to the technology and kind of have fun with it as well. And so uh, about a year ago, I joined a new company called Neuralink, and we're building medical devices for patients with spinal cord injuries. And so we're building a brain-computer interface. It's an implant that's uh, connected to the motor cortex of the brain for patients with paralysis. Uh, so this is somebody with like quadriplegia who uh, is paralyzed and can't actually move their limbs anymore. And so by using this implant, they're able to just think about moving a cursor, and they're able to connect to the computer over Bluetooth and actually control a computer using their thoughts alone which is pretty wild. It's like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life, and I'm still super stoked to work on this. Um, so we're at this really, really cool place where I think we're going from like more of a research lab, like just trying to prove out this technology, and I think we're actually, you know, if you've seen the Monkey Mind Pong YouTube video, if you've seen the pig demo, like we're, we're pretty convinced this works, and it's more about how do we scale out this technology? How do we make sure we're bringing the infrastructure and the resources we need in order to make this happen? And so from an infrastructure perspective, you know, being an infrastructure engineer, this is really exciting because we're really at the early days of this entire industry, to be honest. And definitely in terms of the company, you know, there isn't that much infrastructure there. And what is there is you know, very solid, and I'm super stoked for Logan and all the folks that started before me, but um, I think the ways that we need to grow the company and the challenges we're gonna be facing you know, really require us to make some very hard decisions. And I think right now, in order to make the right calls, we need to have a lot of experience and we need to be able to decide you know, what are the things we want to build and how do we make sure we roll that out in a safe way that's going to scale with the organization so we don't need to like do a ton of migrations again and again and again. And so I think, you know, when I think about, you know, when I joined the company and I started to understand, you know, what are the requirements we have, what are the different problem domains we wanted, you know, we really do need to iterate. We're so small, we need to take advantage of the best technology that there is available and we need to contribute back to that and we need to build it. But I didn't want to go off and like leave like 50 half-baked systems in like a trail of destruction behind me. I didn't want to like leave a bunch of things that are out there, have a couple people try some stuff out, you know, those become critical, but you know, I'm really excited about something new and I'm trying to build a new system. And then meanwhile, I'm also trying to like keep this other system system or these other 20 systems, you know, dragging along. And so I needed the safe place to try out new technology. I wanted somewhere where, you know, it still mattered, but, you know, the sample size was one. You know, it was just myself and, you know, my wife. Um, and, you know, we were the only people who were going to be using this. You know, this is just providing functionality for the personal network and not something that was necessarily going to be involved in the corporate setting. You know, we still want to iterate very quickly when it comes to, the, to work, but I wanted to have, a, you know, sort of a prototype for the prototype before I really jumped into that thing. And so in order to do that, um, you know, again, I sort of thought about, you know, what is it that we're doing at the company and how do I start to apply that and sort of create a, a parallel universe at home? And one of the first things was that uh, thinking about, you know, how even though at work we're still going to be able to leverage the cloud, we want to take advantage of as many managed services as possible. We want to be able to, you know, hand over a lot of that operational workload to, you know, a bunch of the software engineers who've built these battle-tested systems. But at the same time, you know, we have these physical implants, you know, and we're trying to, uh, we need to measure them, we need to understand how they're behaving, we need to track their temperature and a ton of other metadata about them. So that means, you know, we're always going to have, you know, Bluetooth antennas that need to be plugged into some amount of servers. We have, you know, an implant assembly line that, you know, for each of the 
different stations along the line, we have a bunch of sensors that need to be used to validate that we're building the components to within the specifications we have, and there's a ton of software that needs to run to verify that those components are behaving as expected, and that needs to run on something. So each station needs to have physical hardware as well. So, you know, again, as much as I'm, uh, you know, able to leverage the cloud experience that we have, we need to become excellent at running physical hardware. And so that meant that I needed to remember how the heck to do that. And so to start, that means building our own infrastructure as a service. So what is this base layer? How do we think about the infrastructure, the hardware, and the servers that we're going to use? How do we make sure we're able to bring them up in a repeatable and reliable way? And then how are we going to connect all of these servers together so they're going to be able to talk to each other and then we're actually going to be able to access the services that we're building? And again, I kind of touched on this, but I think we're really trying to make sure that, you know, we have this easy opportunity to try new things. You know, if I'm really kind of like, oh, you know, this was a great idea, uh, or it seemed like a good idea at the time, it definitely is not, you know, let's scrap this, throw it away. It's something where I only need to change some configs on my own. You know, I just need to reprovision something. It's not a big deal. Uh, there we go. Um, so when you're looking at the, the opportunities for how can you provision these servers, how can you create these operating systems and make them run, uh, obviously you're thinking about servers. And we're going to talk on you know, some of the different things you can use for that. Uh, you also want to think about how can you isolate out the network. And so we're going to touch on some of the switches you might want to use. Um, if you don't want to use that, we'll talk about crossover cables, which I'd forgotten existed, so I wanted to call them out specifically. Um, and then you can also, thank you, yes, exactly. Um, I've been in the cloud for a long time. So, uh, and then also, if you don't want to deal with this, you know, you can just get started with some VMs, which is great. Um, so as I discovered yesterday when I spilled coffee all over my laptop, um, it is not a good idea to use your daily driver for a bunch of this experimentation. So I would highly recommend not blo having to blow apart, you know, whatever you're using for your day to day, um, since you, again, want to have that opportunity to experiment. You want to be able to try different things. You want to distro hop here and there. You want to try, uh, you know, Fedora Silverblue. You want to try these different OSs and different approaches and see if that's something that's actually beneficial and maybe you can apply that in different areas. Uh, so one of the cool things is the uh, next unit of computing boxes that Intel launched, uh, our PAL System 76, uh, who have a booth in the expo floor, uh, they have this cool little box they call the Meerkat, which is awesome. Uh, so I have two of them running on my desk. Uh, they're great because they're just super easy to, to run a bunch of different things. They don't take up that much footprint. They're pretty low power. Um, so that's been something for me that's been great, is just having these, this hardware has really empowered and enabled a ton of different systems and a lot of experimentation, which is awesome. Um, you know, if you're looking to upgrade your laptop, you can always keep your old one around. That's great because you don't need to plug in a monitor and keyboard. It's super easy. Um, you know, again, this is something I wish I just like thought of years ago. I feel like I really would have benefited a lot from having this uh, environment set up. And so I'm just encouraging y'all to think about like, you know, can you set this up if you don't have this already there? Uh, once you have the physical hardwares, uh, physical hardware set up, uh, you need a way for it to connect to things. And so um, most of us probably have what's called an unmanaged switch. And so this is just like a little tiny box. You can just plug a cable in. Uh, you can connect to it and make things, uh, you know, it'll talk to whatever network it's plugged into and those machines will be able to communicate. Uh, but if you're using something called a managed switch, uh, this is something that's a little bit more advanced, maybe a little more expensive, uh, has more advanced software on there. And it's going to, the firmware uh, will let you customize uh, each port and you can set different things like VLANs, you can set which network these things are on, and you can actually isolate out different services from each other. So if you have like your normal desktop, your normal laptop, or your Wi-Fi router, those can be connected to each other and they can all talk and do their thing. And then you can create a separate isolated network which you're just using for some of this experimentation. And so if you just want to play out, play around with something, like you just want to mess around with Maz, especially as we get into talking about DHCP, if you want to create that isolation, if you're using a managed switch, you'll be able to specifically uh, siphon that traffic off and make sure it can only talk to ports which you've specifically configured and enabled. And these are all different depending on the settings you're using. Um, but for me, this was a great opportunity to get more involved with Fortinet. Uh, we we're using some more of their switches at the office, uh, so that meant I had the chance to like sign up for their support center, you know, figure out how to upgrade the firmware, do all this. And again, this is something where it's like very low effort, you know, I'm just doing it on a weekend for fun and it's not, you know, when it comes time to like upgrading the firmware at, you know, for the core router at the office, I'm like, oh yeah, I know how this goes, you know, I know where to download things, I know how to follow the steps, um, so I'm feeling a lot more confident, which is pretty great. Um, if you don't want to deal with the, the switch, uh, again, the crossover cable is something I'm, again, very embarrassed I forgot about, but uh, what's really cool about this is this is an Ethernet cable where they've actually twisted the wires, and so this cable is taking the input from one laptop, and it's going to the output of the other machine, and it's the same on the other way back. Normally, like a straight-through Ethernet cable, you're expected to plug it into a switch or a router, and the way that that 
uh, those network cards are set up is it's expected to communicate directly uh, in that like a normal pattern where the network cards are set up with that. And machine like laptops and servers, uh, you need something like that that switches it so that way you can communicate that way directly. So this is great because you can just manually configure the network in your operating system and then you don't even need a switch. You can just, again, super easy to set this up. You just need a little cable, it's super rad. Um, so yeah, and these are pretty cheap online, which is great. Or you can make your own if you just have it and you can just switch that out. Uh, and again, if you don't want to deal with any of this stuff, if you just want to get started, uh, you know, any machine that you've got that's running a modern OS, um, you can start virtualizing this. Uh, you know, there's a ton and ton and ton of documentation, ton of tech talks on things like this. Uh, you know, Ubuntu and Canonical have multipass, which is awesome. Um, there's a great tutorial on Maz, so I highly encourage you to check that out if you're not, uh, not familiar with that. Um, okay. So we've got our setup. We generally have some network. Things are plugged in, which is great. Uh, now we need to start talking about like how are we going to power? You know, we need to power on these servers. We need to bring this up. Um, something I didn't realize, but like most of our machines do not have BIOS anymore. This is blew my mind. I, you know, this is very old information to like everybody in this room, I'm sure. But um, but everything's been replaced by a new standard called UEFI, the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. And so for me, you know, I would say like, oh, I'm just gonna like, you know, boot the BIOS and I'm gonna connect in and I'm gonna set it to network boot or something. Totally not a thing. Like none of the machines that I have ha actually have a BIOS anymore. Um, this is all like very ancient technology, and there is no standard like this. This is just like a de facto standard. It just works the way it does because that's how like the IBM PC was created. And this is just like people just sort of like YOLO tried to figure out how to like set this up the same way. Um, and one of the things that it uses is something called a master boot record, which we're going to get into. So um, your machine, uh, the actual laptop or the you know server that you have has some firmware on there and it's very minimal. It basically like powers on the box and it's going to hand over control. This is the the process for booting BIOS essentially. And so this is still helpful to know like you know kind of the basics like where we're coming from. Uh, so this is going to hand over control to the BIOS and what it's going to look for is it's going to uh, look for like a special like set of bytes on the very beginning of your hard drive and it's just like kind of like this magic area that nobody really knows like technically how long it's supposed to be like how much space you have, like how things are formatted, it's all just kind of like uh, reverse engineered essentially. Uh, and everybody just sort of like winks and goes along with it. Um, and so this here, the master boot record, it's a way to structure how the rest of your file system is partitioned. So where can you look for essentially the bootloader? So in Linux, we're using a system called Grub, uh, and Grub is a little bit more advanced. Uh, you're able to build up a little bit more functionality here, and really, this, the, at, once you're at this stage, you're able to think about uh, which Linux kernel version do you want to boot, which operating system do you want to boot. Um, but again, this is like very limited functionality still at this point, um, and really, its, its mission in life is just get the kernel up and running, which again, as most of us know, is kind of that uh, intersection between the hardware and actually the rest of the operating system that you're booting. Uh, so BIOS obviously worked super well. I mean, it, there's a reason it was around for decades. It's, um, you know, it, it made things work out pretty well. Um, but again, one of the uh, several issues, including it can only access one megabyte of, of memory. And so if you think about like, you know, to uh, make fun of myself, you know, if you think about Slack, like there's no way Slack is only taking one megabyte of memory. So, you know, that is really not that much uh, space. And so there's a ton of other downsides to this. <clears throat> In addition, one of the big problems is uh, BIOS is really only good at booting an operating system from disks. And so if you wanted to do something a little bit uh, more intelligent, like for us, we wanted to boot off the network, that's just something we're not going to be able to do, unfortunately. And so huge props to Intel. Uh, they obviously recognized this problem and they created uh, the extensible firmware interface. Um, and then they realized that, you know, hey, it's great that we've got like this thing that we're building on our own, but the PC industry is this huge, you know, there's a ton of different companies. There's firmware vendors, there's motherboard manufacturers, there's PC vendors, uh, there's operating system vendors. All of these different components all need to interact with each other. They all need to know how this system works and they need to be able to communicate with each other. So we need some standard. We need to have some way to agree on how the heck this machine is supposed to work. Like how are you supposed to get this hardware all the way up to something that you know someone like you or I could take advantage of. 
And so that's where the UEFI standard was created. Uh, and there's like an umbrella organization called the UEFI Forum. And this uh, group, they publish all of the standards online. Um, I think it's relatively dry reading personally, but uh, like it's all there if you want to read it. Tons of details, tons of uh, documentation on how to implement this, how all of this stuff works. Uh, we're going to dig into a little bit of this and, and talk about how this, this happens. So uh, one of the big things, obviously now we can take advantage of uh, modern processors. So now this is, again, why I'm saying that you know, this is what most of our systems are using, is UEFI standards. Um, you know, you're really having a lot more capabilities here because you have, um, because you have this opportunity to start to define things. You have uh, a process to make modifications. And uh, one of the big things that it's doing is it's actually defining the, the standard for how are you formatting the uh, file systems on disk, how are you creating that bootable partition, and you're telling the firmware how are you actually going to start to hand over control to the operating system. And so this standard means that you can start to build tools that take advantage of that. This GPT format is a structure that everybody can start to build against and make sure that they know how to use it. Um, there's not too much in there, um, so we won't go into too much detail about it, but really the important part here is now at least we have one way for any system at whatever layer of the stack you're in to be able to, to query that information and figure out what operating systems are available, what are the different partitions, and how can we take advantage of that. So for example, if you're just running you know, Linux right now, you can run EFI Boot Manager, uh, and you can actually print out and you can query that information. Like you can look at that partition and you can see the details about it. And so here you can see, for instance, that uh, you know, using your operating system, you can actually set the boot order for the devices that you have. And so here you see the first thing is 2001 and then 0000. So here first, you know, this is this laptop here. It's, you know, if I plug in a USB drive, that's the first thing that's going to boot. And then uh, you know, if there's no USB drive, then it's going to boot this EFI hard drive, which is great. And so this is something before you'd only be able to change in the firmware. And again, each implementation might be different. There might be different ways of doing this. But again, this is something that now, way up in user space, up in, you know, once you've booted the OS, this is something you can configure the firmware on for your device, which is pretty sweet. All right, so we've got uh, our firmware. We have our UEFI uh, setup. We sort of know that you know, we have a way to configure this stuff. Uh, and so using UEFI, that is the way that we can uh, actually set up our network booting. But in order to get there, we kind of need to like, make sure we run through some of these different systems that you know, if you've been in the cloud for a long time, you may not remember how they work. You may not have experience with that. So the first one we're just going to touch on very briefly is just the concept of a subnet. And so if we think about a network, it's a connection of, it's a uh, collection of machines or a collection of servers. The intranet obviously is a, you know, intranetwork group of networks. So you have multiple networks that all connect and communicate with each other. And then a subnet is a subdivision. So it's kind of, for you know, our use case, we think of it, this is our home lab. So this would be the, you know, all the machines connected to our Wi-Fi that's on our home network here. And so, you know, most folks' standard, uh, standard network is going to be 192, 168, 1.1 you know, or 1.0, and that's going to be something called a slash 24. Long story, we're not going to get into CIDR math or anything in this. There's many folks who will give much better talks about that than I will. But long story short is, uh, you know, typically you're going to have about space for about 256 hosts in your typical network, which is great. And so, you know, when we're thinking about like, hey, maybe we want to create a separate isolated network for Joe's like wild experiments, that's going to be something we're going to create a new sub subnet for, and we're going to configure that network switch to say, hey, anything that gets plugged in here, we want it to be on this 192.168.200 network. And so we maybe we don't set up routing rules, so there's no way for machines on this special experimental network to connect back and you know, corrupt whatever's going on. So if I'm setting up something, you know, again, we're going to talk about DHCP in a moment, but maybe I'm messing around with some of the network settings, you know, that could totally destroy that network. And if I were to do it on the Wi-Fi and I had friends come over, they'd be like, hey, like, why is your Wi-Fi broken? I can't connect. So again, creating that isolation, again, gives you that opportunity to experiment, which is really important. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the, the distinction between unicast addressing and broadcast addressing. And this is super important because we need to think about the distinction between, uh, you know, once I have an IP address, once I'm connected to the network, if I want to, you know, connect to Google, uh, you know, I just looked up DNS here. This is, you know, Google has its own very complicated thing, which again is probably like months of talks to figure out how their network works. But, um, but at this point, you know, if I wanted to connect to Google, this would be the IP address I'm doing. And so when I say, hey, I want to send a search request, my my computer knows that it needs to talk to this IP address, and it's going to send a message which is only intended for Google. And so that's the only server that really cares that I'm talking to it, and it knows that I'm sending this message over to that server. 
And broadcast is very helpful when uh, you need to send a message to everybody on your network. And this is typically restricted to just the subnet that you're on, but this is a way for you to sort of blast out a message, just sort of like I am right now, I'm sending out this whole broadcast message to all of you and you're hearing it, uh, whether or not you want to. And um, you're, uh, you're basically know that you're potentially an re intended recipient for this, uh, for this information. And um, you know, knowing broadcast addressing is important because there's something called dynamic host configuration protocol. And so whenever you turn on your phone or you open up your laptop and you connect to the Wi-Fi or you, you know, join your friend's Wi-Fi, uh, the first thing your computer is gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, I don't have an IP address, which means I cannot communicate with other servers. I can't talk to other machines. And so I need an IP address so that way I can send messages and people know how to reach me and get back to me and send me that information. And so, you know, thank goodness to all the early engineers, I'm sure some of you folks were involved in this, thank you for all the hard work. Um, this is really important because this is how we uh, establish sort of the rules of the road. And so I think in the knock, like two or three rooms over, right Rob, there's a DHCP server over that way? Yeah. Great, S excellent, it's over there. So every time you come up on the network, your client is sending a request and we'll dig into what that looks like here. So it follows a process called Dora. So that's uh, the first step is gonna be the discovery. And so that's when your laptop opens up, you're gonna broadcast a message and you're gonna say, hey, you know, I would, I'm a new machine, uh, I have a specific like hardware address and I need an IP address. Uh, if the network's been configured appropriately, then uh, you're going to have a response. So there's gonna be a server there and it's gonna say, hey, you know, I'm gonna set aside this IP address for you, would you still like this? And 99% of the time, your laptop's gonna say like, heck yes, I definitely want to, I want to stream YouTube or whatever, so I will definitely take that IP address if it's still avail available. And then hopefully the server's gonna agree and say, yep, that sounds great, I, you know, that's yours, I'm gonna mark that down for you know, a certain amount of, uh, amount of time, and that's gonna be your IP address until uh, further notice. So that's great, so at least we've booted up, we've connected to the network, um, and we're gonna be able to you know, get an IP address and send traffic. The next thing we need to think about, again, when we're thinking about, you know, how do we want to get, um, get an operating system to actually boot, is, you know, we need to get that data onto your hard drive. So again, if I'm, you know, taking a server from, from scratch, and I need to get an operating system, uh, probably, I think there's this thing called Linux, uh, if I want to get that installed, I need to get that data transferred over here. Uh, but this process is happening, um, you know, there's no operating system, right? And so we need a protocol that's very, very simple, or trivial, uh, and so this is gonna be something that hopefully is very easy to implement, that's very standardized, and is very clear how to do this. So essentially, um, once you know where a TFTP server is, you're basically able to make a request to that on port 69, and you say, hey, I would like to receive this file. And the server is gonna respond back, if it's just a read request, which for us is all it's going to be, uh, it's just gonna respond back with a data packet, and each time it sends a data packet uh, over the UDP protocol, you have to respond back and acknowledge that, and say, yep, cool, I got it, give me more data. And it's just gonna respond back with more data, you're gonna write that down, say give me more, and you keep going until you receive the data. Um, the way you know it's done is when you do not, when you, the data message you receive is not the full size of the data packet, when it's truncated, that means you know you've reached the end, which is great. And if the last one is like perfectly sized, so it's the full length, uh, the server will actually send you back a packet that's a data packet of size zero. So once you get that, you know you're done, which is great. Awesome, so we've built up uh, a way to get an IP address, we built up a way to get an OS image, um, which is important because now we're able to talk about something called Pixie. And so this pre-boot execution environment uh, is a standard, actually, it's been around for a long time, but it was finally added to UEFI, and this is the way that most machines are actually gonna request that network image. And so, you know, at work or in a lot of server environments, uh, like this is the way, this is the process that servers go through in order to get that network image, which is great. So we're gonna build on top of uh, these two protocols that we've already defined earlier. Uh, the big one that we're gonna do is during that Dora process, during that initial discover request, we're actually gonna add some special configuration. And we're gonna say, hey, I actually don't just want an IP address, I'm also ready to rock and roll and I want a new version of Linux. So I wanna get you know, whatever operating system you've got for me, I wanna take that and I wanna boot that, which is pretty great. Um, so if you have a special DHCP server which is configured appropriately, which, you know, spoiler alert, Maz is configured appropriately, um, it's going to tell you, hey, you know, here's your network information, here's the subnet you're on, here's your DNS servers, uh, but also here's some information about where you want to go to get 
a TFTP server to get that data you're looking for. That's where you're going to go to get that network, that operating system image. Uh, one caveat uh, about TFTP is there is absolutely zero security built into the image. So if you want to do some like extra validation or extra check something that's 100% on you, that is not part of the protocol. So there's you know no security on any of this stuff. So you know if you've heard of the term of like a rogue DHCP server um, handing out leases, like you know, make sure that if you are sending out a Pixie request, you know, hopefully you are in control of that network and you know that your TFTP server is, you know, secured and somebody hasn't put, like, sketchy images on that box, which is for, you know, the home lab is very unlikely, which is great. All right, so we know how to boot things. We know how to set, you know, we know the fundamentals here. We know sort of the first principles about how to actually use these protocols and how to leverage this. And so now we can talk about a specific implementation about how to take advantage of these things. So Metal as a Service, again, comes out of Canonical and the Ubuntu community. Um, and for us, you know, this is how we're going to provision our servers very quickly. And so we're thinking about, again, reducing the cost of errors, you know, making it really easy to, you know, kind of have that similar cloud-like experience. Like, hey, you know, I just trashed this operating system. I was messing around with system D. Uh, you know, I don't know how I, like, blew up my network manager config. This is really bad. I'm just going to re-image this box. Like, I've had it. Like, I don't have time for this. Like, this was fun. Now it's not. Let's start over. Um, so this is pretty great because it provides a lot of that abstractions that make it much easier. And so, you know, we're going to dig into a lot of the, like, implementation details. There's, again, uh, the Maz team actually has, like, totally revamped their docs in the last, like, three weeks. Tons and tons of details in there, which is great. So I highly recommend going through that or checking out some of the tutorials. Uh, we're going to spend most of the time on the implementation. Um, but going through the web UI, it's pretty self-explanatory if you know these fundamentals and you can apply this to the process. So there's three different components we need to think about here. So the first one is going to be called the region, D, the region controller or region D. And this one you're typically going to use uh, one per office or like one per location. For us, obviously, in our lab, we're, still, we're going to have one of everything, obviously. Um, but this is something which I think of as like the brains of the operation. This is where you're really going to be thinking about, uh, you know, doing a lot of that processing. Uh, this is where you're going to locate that web UI, that API server. Uh, this is the thing that, you know, as an engineer, like, this is what I'm going to be interacting with uh, as a human day to day. Um, it's going to persist all of that data in a PostgreSQL database. And so that obviously, you know, if you, you know, for us, you know, it's a home lab, it's not really that much work. So, you know, I'm not going to worry about backups or anything like that. But if you're deploying this in a production environment, that you'd want to care about, make sure it's replicated and you had backup set up, things like that. Um, region D itself has nothing to do with DHCP. It doesn't respond to the network requests. Uh, the rack controller is what's responsible for talking to machines. So the rack D server is what machines communicate with. So region D I think about is for humans and then rack D for machines. So this is what's going to serve DHCP and it's also going to handle uh, uh, the Pixie process, which means it's also going to serve the TFTP server as well. Now, the important part, though, is that RACD is what uh, I'm very thankful is it's stateless, which means that most of the time it's actually proxying the request back to the region D server. When, so when a request comes in, which we'll see in a, in a moment, uh, it's actually talking to region D, which is what, it, uh, what knows what to respond with. So RACD doesn't need too much configuration. We're doing all of that in region D, which is great. Uh, so here's the... Um, the typical MAS flow. Let me set this a little bit better, I think. Um, so when we do want to add a machine, uh, one of the first things we need to do is actually enlist this box. And so enlistment um, is when you're first connecting this uh, into MAS, and you're sort of first telling the MAS server what the heck is going on here. And uh, MAS actually has some pretty comprehensive scripts in there whose sole purpose in life is to figure out like what in the world is on this hardware. Like how many hard drives are there, what type of network card is there, how much memory is in this box. And it's trying to just sort of like query anything and everything it can think about, figure out all the little details like what hardware vendor. Um, if you are like dealing with enterprise hardware, there's something called IPMI or uh, like lights out management, uh, which is super cool and we're not going to get into. But um, all of that stuff is what Maz is trying to figure out so it knows how to communicate and deal with this hardware. So the first thing you're doing is you're actually going to enlist this box, and you're going to bring it into this uh, state where it's going to run a lot of these built-in commissioning scripts. And so these are sort of the defaults and kind of give Maz this like first pass, pass of just like, what the heck is this hardware and how do I deal with it? Once you've done that, it actually creates an entry in the Maz database. The region D server persists that. And then it's going to create a cool page in the web UI, and it's going to show you a lot of those details. So it's going to tell you, like, oh, you have an Intel network card. You have, like, a Samsung hard drive. You have 64 gigs of RAM, whatever you have. 
Once it's in new state, that's where you need to commission the machine. And this is a little bit more advanced because you can actually run some custom commissioning scripts. And so if you have extra hardware that you've added that maybe aren't uh, being queried for uh, in the default set of commissioning scripts, this is what's actually gonna query that and make that available in Maz if you need to. Uh, it also can do things like actually update NTP, so update the system time and gather some extra information, which is good. And then at this point, it's gonna mark the machine as ready. And all of this so far has basically been to get us to this point. This box is finally like able to, um, it's finally allocated and it's finally ready to take, uh, like be pixie booted and actually like install an operating system here. So we needed all of this like, you know, 1975 knowledge or whatever just to, like install Linux for the most part. Uh, so the last step there is when you actually deploy the box. And this is where you decide like, hey, I want to like install Ubuntu 2004 or 2204. I want to install this cloud in it configuration on there, which we'll get into. Um, but basically here you've like got a ton of the details. You know what sort of hardware there is. You know what architecture it is. You know what image is appropriate. And you're going to be able to deploy this onto the box. Uh, if you needed to add these custom templates, uh, they're on the region controller, and they're just located in this directory. And you can actually take a look at some of the scripts, and you can see, you know, what is it that they're doing? How are they querying this information? And there's a lot of cool things if you want to dig into some of the hardware and see how all of this is presented and how it's available. So there's, again, a ton of information that you can find here, which is pretty cool. Uh, and highly encourage you to go into the Maz docs, because they're actually very comprehensive here if you have more questions. Uh, so now we're going to really dig into commissioning uh, and really understand, you know, what does this process look like and how does Maz make this work? So when you first plug in your laptop or the server that you're going to be dealing with, the first thing that it's going to do, again, is, you know, make that DHCP request. And if you've set up the, in UEFI, if you've set that to network boot, it's going to add in those special configuration and it's going to say, hey, you know, not only do I want that IP address, but I also want to uh, connect to a Pixie server and I want to actually get that TFTP image so I can run those commissioning scripts. So RACD is going to, you know, which is configured as your DHCP server, it's going to respond to that. And uh, before it sends that response back, it's actually going to query the region controller. And it's going to ask it, um, hey, I need some of this boot metadata. Like, I need to get some of the details about where's uh, the location of the right kernel, where's the uh, TFTP, uh, let me make sure that I'm going to be the TFTP server you want me to use. Um, and it's going to query region D to get that information. And all that stuff is, you know, the defaults for us are just going to work just fine. So once RACD gets that information, it's going to pass that back to the server that you're provisioning, and it's going to send that Pixie configuration back to the box. And the box is going to do that thing where it uses TFTP to connect to that server. It's going to write out that uh, ephemeral image. It's going to boot from that temporary image, and then it's going to run all those commissioning scripts and get that information there. Um, it's also going to fetch something uh, called cloud init. Uh, from the region D server once the box spins up, which we're going to get into a lot more detail. Um, and then it's also going to query the RACD server uh, and tell it, hey, like, here's all this metadata that I found. I want you to talk to the region D server, and I want you to persist this way down in Postgres. So this is how uh, the, the commissioning process works and how we get all that information we need in MAS. So then as we go through and say, like, oh, like, you know, which server do I want to deal with, you have all of these details here, and you're able to figure out, you know, oh, is this the right box that I want to re redeploy or re-image, um, you know, you have all that information there available. Um, once it's done with that process, it's like published that metadata, the box is actually going to shut itself down. So there's, this is again just an ephemeral image, it's just like a temporary thing that just gets you this information. You're not really installing the operating system when you're commissioning. That's the job of the deployment phase. And so once you deploy, you're using the same, uh, you know, again, assuming you're using Ubuntu, you're using the same installer you would on a live CD, and that's a tool called Curtain. And Curtain is short for the Curt installer. It's like whole mission in life is just insto install stuff really quickly. Um, and on first boot, uh, it's gonna execute a program called Cloud Init, which we're gonna talk about in just a bit. But to really dig into Curtain, um, the whole mission here is it's supposed to be able to handle um, a few different configurations and make sure no matter what you're going to, what setup you have, you're going to be able to write a new operating system image onto a hard drive here. And so it's uh, basically it's just like a really like uh, robust like DD command essentially. Um, so the first thing it's going to do is again you've kicked off that boot, and so that's whether you've like plugged in a USB thumb drive, you've got a CD-ROM, or you've done the network boot, and you're basically bringing up this like live image, which is gonna run the curtain installer. 
And so the, first, the next stage it's gonna do is run what are called early commands. And this is basically loading in some modules for some configuration. Uh, you're gonna set up some environment to make sure that the hardware is primed. And then if you want to, you can actually update uh, your apt cache. So that way you make sure you have all the latest Ubuntu packages when you're installing. So you're not installing some like super out of date version. Uh, once you've done that, the next step is actually partition the hard drive. Uh, so again, we actually wanna persist this. We want to write an OS image. And so we really need, you know, we wanna create the partitioning scheme correctly. Hopefully we're gonna use, uh, like, you know, we're gonna make the EFI boot uh, partition. Uh, hopefully we're gonna use the GPT format, again, because we're using UEFI, because BIOS is deprecated, haha. Um, and we're also gonna create the template for the file system tab, or the FS tab. And so this is where, um, we're not actually writing FSTAB, we're actually just going to write out a template, which will be written out a little bit later. Uh, the next step is then gonna be doing a little bit of network setup. So this is uh, actually gonna, again, write out a template to configure your network. Um, and uh, the reason we're writing the template is because when we write the disk image, we wanna add that configuration after that's written out. So here, typically, you're gonna get a tarball with the Ubuntu OS. Uh, this is what's gonna get extracted onto the disk that you've just partitioned, and you're gonna write all of that information out onto the hard drive. Uh, the last thing I, uh, I actually, for this talk I discovered, I didn't even realize this was a thing, but you can actually add a little like webhook at the end of the installation process. So if you have like a Slack team or like Discord or whatever, you can actually like configure it to like post in a channel and say like, hey, like, you know, I've been inst finished installing, so this box is ready to go. Um, so I thought this was pretty cool. It's an extra little hook that you can configure and add that in there, which is awesome. Um, Sorry, uh, that was too early. So this is extra configuration, which you can set up, maybe install the webhook script, and then here's where you can actually execute that script once you put that in there. All right, so again, we're like building up these layers, right? So we have an operating system installed. Pretty much we're mostly like a stock Ubuntu image at this point, and so we really need to like, you know, we wanna install like the stuff that we want, right? Like we don't wanna just like have you know, it's great we can install an ISO, but like, you know, we could just plug in a thumb drive and it's not really saving us that much time. What I think really gets interesting is using a tool called CloudInit. And if you're running on any of the cloud providers, they all support this tool. Um, Amazon, you might be familiar with user data. It's essentially, uh, use it, like, it's using CloudInit to run this stuff and it's the same format, which is great. So um, this program is what runs on the first boot. So after you've created the image, it's the first time that you're actually gonna exit bring up the system, it knows that it needs to execute this code and execute the configuration that you've given it. And so an example would be, this is you know very basic, but uh, you're basically, well, this, this is the cloud native part of the talk because it's YAML, but uh, it's basically the first thing you're gonna do is the package update, so make sure you're running apt update, getting the latest uh, packages from the repository, and then you can upgrade them, and then you're also gonna create a user ID. Uh, there's a ton of like additional features that you can use. This is awesome because you can actually connect to GitHub and then pull down your SSH keys. Uh, it also has launch pad support for anybody who still uses that. Um, so this is great because like, you know, again, even if we just did this, this means that we can just provision a new image, uh, we can provision a new server, and you know, we always know that we're, we're able to start from scratch, and that's awesome. But uh, unfortunately, you know, sometimes you're just like, I wanna try a couple different instances or I wanna run this application, you know, maybe I don't wanna deal with you know, all the common pr problems we think about when it comes to isolating different application versions or different libraries. So we need probably another platform. Uh, and as one of the quotes I use all the time is obviously the solution is add another layer of indirection or abstraction, um, which means I finally need to learn Kube, um, which I try to avoid through most of my time at Slack, much to the chagrin of my colleagues. So um, here's where we really get to move very quickly, and you know, there's a ton of documentation for running K3s, so we don't really need too much. You know, like if you wanted to just get a Kubernetes instance running on your server, you can just add this to your cloud in it, and it's going to be there. It's wild. So uh, huge props to the rancher folks. Um, huge props to Patrick at the SUSE booth yesterday for giving me the tools to try and save my laptop yesterday. Um, so props to all these folks. But uh, yeah, K3s is super solid. Um, again, it wasn't something that I wanted to like go too deep into. So, um, you know, there's a ton of opportunity here to like really play around with, you know, what are the best uh, kube distros you want to use? How are you want to run this? Um, and how are you going to configure this appropriately? But if you just want something super easy, this is uh, going to be great. Um, so we've pretty much like made it most of the way through. We've got you know a platform and we've got Kube, right? And so now we have a way to get servers on our desk running Kube. 
Uh, if you wanted to create a second kube config, uh, second cloud init file, if you wanted to have multiple servers that are all connected to the same kube cluster, uh, you can actually set some environment variables here, and you can pass it the name of your initial Kubernetes server that you provisioned. So the first one you spin up probably looks like this. The second server you spin up, you're going to pass in a few uh, a few details like the the IP address for the Kubernetes uh, server, as well as uh, like a little passcode, basically like a little certificate that you're going to pass over so it can authenticate and join the cluster. So again, doing this and having this means you can just start to like provision, you know, a ton of like Raspberry Pis or a bunch of other servers you have lying around, and you can really add them together pretty easily. And if again any of them have problems, or you want to add a new one or replace one, again using Cloud Init, you can do this super super quickly, which is really cool. Um, so again, I was using Mac OS for a long time, um, which you know was fine. But uh, there's a great to-do app called OmniFocus. Um, but again, I was thinking about you know for me the killer app was you know, running this command line to do app, which is very appropriate for scale, I think. Uh, but there's also a bunch of other applications like Home Assistant, uh, which is a really awesome Python project, has a ton of uh, community support behind it. Uh, you can think of it kind of like an open source HomeKit or like an open source Alexa. Um, and it's really great because it actually works across a lot of these ecosystems. And so for folks who use uh, different components from like, you know, the Google, Google Home ecosystem or Alexa, you can use something like Home Assistant to sort of bridge that gap, and I believe the plugin is called Homebridge, actually, to tie Home Assistant together with HomeKit, um, which is awesome. And again, you're running all of this locally, so you don't need to worry about you know, extra network latency. Uh, you don't need to worry about you know, who am I giving access to all this data. This is all code that's you know, running on your desk at this point, which is super cool. Uh, you can also run like the Plex Media Server if you have, again, a bunch of home videos or something that you want to show off. Um, and then even there's like cool like self-hosted apps, like I think it's Tandoori Recipes, like if you want to have like a recipe server that you're running. Um, but again, this is really giving you a lot of control. You know, you can run different apps, you control the data, you don't have to worry about where is it being stored, what happens if like, you know, Google Reader gets shut down, things like that. So, um, you know, I think the usual benefits we all know about open source start to, to come into play here, which is pretty great. Um, so I think again, we as we're thinking about apps though, we get kind of the benefit of kind of diverging from sort of what I would consider like SRE best practices. You know, I am very hesitant to kind of diverge from sort of what the like the best practice of the upstream project is. And so the task server is expected to be installed um, like directly on the OS and is not necessarily like, there isn't like a ton of folks that are necessarily running this in a containerized environment. But since it's just me, you know, if this thing goes down or if I need to troubleshoot something, like I only have myself to blame and it's something where I can fix on my own schedule and that's fine. So. Here it's totally something that's that's great, but fortunately there's uh, Yehengi. I don't even know how to pronounce this person's name, but uh, this person on the internet decided to Dockerize the task server and actually create some kube config, which was awesome. Um, I made a couple of tweaks we'll dig into, but uh, huge props to this person for like blazing the trail and getting a bunch of this set up. Uh, so if you want to look at the Docker file, uh, it's up here on GitHub. Um, I kind of broke down the Docker file here, but again, this is all the stuff that we're used to doing, right? But it's just that we're able to run this on our desk, which is pretty great. So uh, we're just going to check out the, the repository of the code. Uh, we're using CMake to configure the build, and then we're just going to build the, the actual application. Uh, we're going to expose the ports. So we're going to tell Docker that, hey, I'm going to be running something that's going to be listening on the network on these ports. So make sure this is available so I can actually connect this application. And then we're setting the entry point, which is what the actual uh, application that's going to run there that we've built. Uh, one interesting thing about the task server in particular, uh, and the reason that I'm actually like comfortable running this, uh, is that it does actually use TLS for, uh, for auth. And so you do need to generate certificates. Um, there's some decent documentation in the upstream project. Uh, I wrote a little like helper, which uh, this is just kind of the summarized version basically. Um, but basically here, if you generate some client certificates and the server side certificate, um, so long as you're transferring the client certs to your devices securely, uh, you'll be the only person that's able to access this data, which obviously is important. So, um, so you'll need these and uh, we're gonna use this as we deploy this to the kube cluster. Uh, so again, so I have a little fork. Um, we're gonna just uh, dig into the actual script that's running. Uh, but basically here, uh, this is just, uh, you know, again, if we're used to kube, this is how you run all these instances and how you deploy this. So first we're creating the namespace to make sure that we're isolating the pods and making sure that all these resources are within their own uh, area within the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we're creating a persistent volume claim, which again is, you know, uh, K3s by default gives us this like local path provisioner, which is just a, basically just like writing files directly to disk, which for us is perfect, right? Like we don't need some like web scale 
scale solution that like persists to like 17 regions around the globe. Like we just, you know, I have a cute little meerkat on my desk, right? And that's what's going to take the data. So that's fine. Um, so we're setting that up. We're setting configuration. Um, and then just for my own sanity, because I kept forgetting as I was like iterating on this a few times, I just added this little helper to remind me to set up the dang TLS certs. Um, and then we're actually going to upload all of those certificates once we've generated them, which is great. So we've done it. You know, all of this work, you know, going back to like 1975, just so that way Joe can actually run his like to-do to -do app in his terminal. But, you know, we've created this thing. It was, you know, may not be what you want to use, but it's what I wanted to use. So that's the beauty of the home lab. So that way we can actually take advantage of, um, you know, using this and creating this fun environment. You know, I finally got to use Kubernetes after being cranky at it for, you know, five or six years. Uh, you know, we got to have a lot of experience with Maz. We're able to provision these servers and make sure we understand, you know, from first principles, like how are we going to build this out? What are the protocols that are necessary? And again, now that I'm going back to work, you know, come Monday, I'll be able to uh, do a great job at building this infrastructure. And I have a lot more context, and I have a lot more opinions about what I like and what I don't like because I've gone through this process. You know, we've, I finally had to deal with physical machines. Thank God I did because yesterday I had to do surgery on my laptop. Uh, and again, we've, we've kind of created our home lab, and now we're, uh, hopefully you're excited to build your own as well. So uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, we're hiring at Neuralink. Uh, comes check us out in the expo floor, and thanks again, everybody, for the time. Does anybody have any questions? We got like 10 minutes for questions. Going once. Oh. Sweet. Um, I may have missed it, but where did you install Maz on? Uh, that is a great question. I actually just use Snap to install Maz on the box uh, itself. Just uh, so you do need to have like. Um, that is a, I did not add that, that is so wild. Uh, so you do need to have a separate server uh, that I provisioned. Um, so that's why I was saying like, you have you know, multiple machines for that. So for that, I just dedicated something to run Maz. And so that's the thing that's serving DHCP. And so that's where uh, I didn't want to get too wild. There is, I think Airship, I think, does have a Maz running in Kubernetes. Um, but I think that's just running on 2.8. And now I think we're on 3.2 just got released. So um, exactly, correct. Linux box running Maz is the TLDR. Um, quick question about the hardware setup. Um, I'm trying to set up my home lab as well. Awesome. But I'm thinking about like server ITX um, motherboard and use IPMI for accessing to it. What's your recommendation for hardware setup? Uh, the hardware setup for using, uh, for using IPMI or? Just regular like, setup, like the whole home lab. Like motherboard, CPU, like. Oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, like, I think if you wanted to build your own, like, hardware or, like, try out, like, if you have some vendor that you use at work that you think is cool or something, um, definitely finding that overlap is great. Um, I think for me, like, I think just finding these, like, meerkats was great, right? Because I didn't necessarily want to go through, like, you know, which motherboard is compatible. I didn't have, uh, I don't have any IPMI at home, and so that is a downside. Um, but I think that's definitely, you know, for me at least, I think that's definitely the next step is, like, automating that and then getting Maz to, like, automatically power on and off boxes is super awesome. So, um, yeah, so I'd love to see your blog post or your talk next year, what you decide. Hi, right, great talk. Um, next year, this year's a great talk there. Um, any considerations for security in your lab, or is it, is it walled off so that no one can really get to it? Oof. Um, I am so thankful for all my colleagues who actually know how security works. I'm very, very stoked. Um, I think I like, like for me, I was like, oh yeah, like there's certs, like cert off, this is great, that's all I need. Um, I think I'm definitely, uh, I'm actually starting to look, uh, so my colleagues at Slack built something called Nebula, um, which is like an alternative to like WireGuard or uh, TailScale. Um, so I think something like that, so you don't necessarily need to like expose ports on the open internet is really, really appealing. Uh, right now, naively I am, I have opened the like task server port on the router, um, so I do have that like, exposed. Um, so yeah, I think like, uh, you know, that is something that I'm definitely thinking about. So I think something like tail scale, if you haven't looked into it, is, seems super cool. So, um, but that basically creates like a, like a very like interesting virtual private network. So you don't actually need to like make this connection and you don't need a ton of extra servers. You basically have this like virtual network where only your servers can communicate with each other no matter where they are in the world. It's like, it feels like magic. It's super cool. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, hey, Joe. Um, hey, so, did you have any problems with UEFI 
on the Meerkats, or were that was that pretty uh, straightforward from like configuring it to to do the the net boot? Uh, fortunately, I did not have many problems. I think I just had like. Uh, I think it was more like a personal problem where I was just like, oh my God, it's not BIOS anymore? Like, when did this happen? Like, I don't, so I think that was just something that like, I needed to like correct my misunderstanding. Um, so yeah, I think that just like, under, like appreciating that I think helped a lot because then it, uh, I think like it helped me not be afraid of like going to the firmware anymore, if that makes sense. Like, I think just like feeling more comfortable, like knowing what's going on, like knowing how to partition things, like knowing which disks I'm dealing with. Um, I think having that f those fundamentals, I think was actually super valuable. But yeah, I think overall the UEFI was was pretty solid. So, um, and then uh, the Lemur Pro is rocking core boot, which is awesome. So, yeah, open source firmware, very sweet. Any other questions? You're making me run. Nope, nope. Uh, my IP is uh, 127001, I think. Same as yours, I think. Uh, all right. Uh, what do you do for electrical power protection for your equipment? Uh, great question. Um, I grabbed some, th I don't even know if it's actually good or not, but I did have the same question and I found something on uh, Amazon for like 70 bucks or whatever. And it, it's not a battery backup. I don't really care about a power supply or, or sorry, I don't care about a battery backup just yet. Um, but it is something that uh, it's like a, seems like just a fancy surge protector. Um, so I am like, I didn't necessarily want to like plug stuff straight into the wall just in case like there's some like uh, like dirty power coming in or something. So it should, I think, I forget the details of that, but it should like even out the curve, power curve or something. Is that a thing? That thing. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks everybody. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I would definitely look into that if, it sounds like you're thinking about that already, so. Okay, so more about your presentation. How did you make the slideshow? I really liked your theme there. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, the project is called Look At Me. Um, I cannot take any credit for that. I should have added it back here, but. Uh, run this again. Uh, right there, the first bullet point right there is the GitHub repo. So it's a Python project. So if you just pip install that, that'll, um, that'll work. Yeah, I was like blown away. It's, it's pretty awesome, so. Yeah, you just write markdown and like each markdown document is uh, a new slide, so it's super cool. So for a home network Kubernetes cluster, how small and portable can you go? Uh, there I mean, are, are there a lot of, is sure. it, I, and it, cause I, I missed the beginning on the hardware you're running. Mm -hmm. um, I, but the, can you just, can it be as small as r Raspberry Pis or, or smaller? Yeah, and totally. also, mm -hmm. can the can the cluster be uh, uh, based on a wireless network? Sure. Yeah. Out Good of questions. the box. Yeah. So I think uh, you can definitely set up uh, like your servers on a wireless network. Um, I think this is where like me being a little annoying. I think I just wanted to have that, you know, there's nothing better than just plugging in. You can totally do wireless and it's probably gonna be fine. Um, and then in terms I mean of like if the, if mm -hmm. you could UEFI boot mm -hmm. over wireless. Uh, if. Wouldn't that be cool? Does, do we have any experts that actually know the answer to this question? Logan? Yeah. Eh? I'm hearing eh. Not yet. Probably. Coming I soon. Would. I don't know about soon. I mean, <laughs> like the time scales we're talking about, like soon is relative. Before guess, scale like. 30. Before scale 30, that might be a thing, yeah. Good. I don't think we'll get like WPA7 support though, but you know, maybe we'll see, so. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of YouTube videos. Like if you just search for like Home Lab, there's a ton of like awesome folks who are like super stoked about this. Uh, this one uh, vlogger, Techno Tim, uh, just started this thing called 100 Days of Home Lab, which is awesome. Wow, this is wild. Um, so I think this was just a few months ago, actually. So there's a ton of folks who are like talking about their home labs, like making a ton of videos, um, kind of like really building and encouraging a lot of this stuff. So there's like infinite ways to set this up. So uh, I also want to give a huge plug to the self-hosted podcast. Um, just great folks. Um, if you're not subscribed to like the Destination Linux podcast, uh, like the Touch, Tux Digital Network, like a lot of those folks are doing awesome work and like really um, like encouraging a lot of people to do cool stuff with technology. So uh, there's just like a ton of like momentum that's being built through this community, which is super cool. Yeah, and I think somebody made like a 40 Raspberry Pi like Kube cluster or something that they were talking about on YouTube, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, uh, give it up again.